Hello everyone, this is CM Kozeman again. As you can hear today, the acoustics are not bad. I got some great acoustics because I am recording in a car, yes. I had this episode in mind for nearly a week now because a friend from Twitter, Ian Trawinski, wrote to me with a very, very well written, very erudite set of questions about speculative zoology and speculative biology in general and i've been getting these kinds of questions a lot these days and you know ian was such a such a good uh, he had such a good way to write these questions that you know man i'm gonna make a youtube video out of these and he agreed and i believe these are going to be used for a school project so if you are ian trevinsky's teachers or anyone who's assessing his assignment Give this guy a straight A+, plus, please. You know, he knows what he's doing. He writes in a way that's wise beyond his years, you know, all around cool and great guy. Okay, so last week I received this letter, an old-fashioned letter. Oh my God, this car's acoustics are so good. I can, I can do all sorts of Foley effects in this car and nobody disturbs me. Okay. Hello again, Mr. Kozeman, he said. Allow me to offer my thanks for once more for your willingness to assist me in the creation of my paper. Yes, and being so quick to respond to my initial query. Thank you. Now you can see that Ian has a really nice way of, nice and very formal way of writing. Something we don't see too much these days. The following are my questions for you in regards to the current and future states of the speculative biology subgenre of fiction as well as some general history of this unique form of scientifically informed fiction. And you can see the way this guy writes, not a single word is wasted. And, you know, he's already got the makings of a good writer, I believe. So all the, all the best for him in the future. Okay, here we go with these questions one by one. Let me just mm, drink some water before starting. Number one, what characteristics should a work of fiction possess to delineate it as belonging to the genre of speculative biology? Well, I would say something about, you know, if it has got imaginary creatures, if it has got imaginary uh, beings on alien worlds, it could be speculative biology. But no, because that's too loose a definition. Because, you know, you got speculative biology works about... I mean, potentially you could have such works about maybe the evolution of telepathic beings or uh, I had such an early project once. Uh, it's about what if we could see feelings or emotions as living creatures. So if it's like a hateful emotion, it's got like tough jaws or if it's like a depression kind of thing, you know, it's got smothering arms, you know, that also could be considered a form of speculative bi biology. So I would say... First and foremost, a work of fiction should f be in the format of a lore or world-building narrative, let's say. That's the number one uh, mark you should look for when you're looking for a work of speculative biology. Now, in 99.9% .9 of these cases, the world-building is going to be about an alien world or a future world or a parallel evolution world. But, you know, these can vary. So I guess the number one characteristics is uh, it being laid out in an expositionary kind of non-linear, non-narrative just lore and world building format. I think that's the base characteristic. Okay, number two. Are there any obscure works of speculative biology that you feel have really influenced the subgenre as a whole? And then he gives some examples. <coughs> now, everybody knows about, almost everybody knows about Wayne Barlow's work, Dougal Dixon's work, The Future is Wild, my work, uh, Olaf Stapledon's amazing, like, these really are like the Old and New Testament. He's got two books. One is called Star Maker. The other one is called Mana... No, no, no. What was it called? Ah. One is called Star Maker. And the other one is called Last and First Man. Now, these really are the Old and New Testaments of speculative 
biology or speculative evolution you really cannot go anywhere without reading these books first and so if you haven't give them a read i could also um, remark there are some lesser known works for example carl kofoed now that's spelled carl with a k kofoed k-o-f-o-e-d I don't know what it's about guys with K last names that maybe there's something that draws us to speculative evolution. But so this guy, Karl Kofoet, had a section in the long running heavy metal fantasy comic magazine. Now, heavy metal, now, now it's almost become a boomer thing, but it, it's a very popular fantasy science fiction comic magazine. The last few decades of this magazine are not memorable in any way or form but in the late 70s and the 1980s and even until the late 1990s they had some great stories great amazing content you know before before tumblr this was where you looked for for fantastic fiction or bizarre sexual otherworldly fantasies so anyways this magazine had one corner that was used by this great artist and writer Karl Kofoet for a section called Galactic Geographic. So, and this also came out as a book later on. So Galactic Geographic by Karl Kofoed. It's a really, really great little book of these one-pager comics he used to have in the Heavy Metal magazine. And they're all about the exploration of the universe and encounters with alien races, alien structures, alien biospheres. Really well illustrated too. I, I wonder why it never got more traction and it's not better known, but so there. And also for obscure works of great speculative biology, just look into DeviantArt or various internet platforms. I believe the, the internet is hosting the best speculative biology projects ever to be written. It's only our misfortune that these projects are not laid out in books you can buy directly and easily from a bookstore or online. And that's actually, like, as a side note, a sorely needed area of development for this subgenre in general. I mean, we got some great artists, great writers, great idea builders, world builders, but... I believe we really need to work more, myself included, we really need to work more on packaging our ideas into like these publishable, like easily readable one item books, you know, and maybe in the future I will show you a little tutorial about how to make these books and how to make, how to package your speculative evolution project in a book. So that's also another to do for me. Okay, number three. Ian asks, how do you go about designing speculative, speculative life forms and ecosystems? How much real world science goes into your work? Okay, the real world science goes in the background. So I study like real life animals or fossil animals or patterns of evolution really closely. But when I'm designing animals for my world design project, Snyad, for example, I don't really like have a science phase. I mean, this is in the background. It's like a knowledge of colors, you know. When you're painting, you don't really go and review colors all over again. You just start painting and it's kind of become inbuilt to your creation cycle. And this is always in my background. What happens with me is, bizarrely enough, 99% of the time, I make doodles. I make a lot of doodles and then one of them sounds or looks interesting to me. And I take this doodle and I enlarge it on a Xerox machine, you know, like 400 times bigger. I scan it. I lay it out on an A4 size paper and enlarge it, but also reduce the opacity to 20%. So it's like a faint gray and really big version of that doodle. I then work it over. I have a second like sketch, let's say. And then the shape falls into place and all the things. And then, because I've been working on this project for a long time, I got this background of all these animals, these niches built up. So I say, hmm, this looks like it could belong to that clay, but only this kind of lifestyle. So then I assign it the biological roles and the biological realism. And then in that section, I may need to do some tweaking. For example, I... Let's say I drew this really nice creature with a long neck and these like spikes on its back. I and mean, visually it looks great. It's a tiny doodle. I then 
assign it a kind of ecological context and I say hmm, maybe this is an animal as big as a moose and it lives on a kind of flat pampas type of ground with lots of mud. So if it lives on a muddy ground, maybe I make its feet wider. If it's a really big animal, I make its overall muscles larger. I make its eyes smaller because, you know, when you get a giant animal, the eyeball really isn't that big. So little tweaks like that. And then, ding, it's ready. But of course, everybody has their own way of working. You know, some, some artists I know, they just write these niches they need to fill out and then fill out those niches scientifically and like rigorously. And, you know, those are really great. An example for this is my close friend Biblaridion. He's got his Alien Ecologies YouTube channel. Go visit it. It's in the video description. Biblaridion. Okay, okay. Number four, do you have any thoughts or insights on the recent resurgence of interest in this subgenre, especially considering how your story, All Tomorrows, is at the center of this miniature creative, creative renaissance? Okay, All Tomorrows was my adolescent teenage angst and frankly a little cringy future evolution story I wrote when I started college. And Thanks to a good collaboration between myself and the popular YouTube channel Alt Shift X, it exploded in popularity, like beyond anything I could imagine. And thanks to this popularity, now I see the good things in this work. Before, I almost was very close to disowning it. And so thanks to this resurgence, now I'm actually rewriting and reillustrating and remaking it into a book. But I don't answer any questions about All Tomorrows because I get so many questions that if I did, I wouldn't be able to do anything else, including my day job. I believe this resurgence is not a coincidence, though. I mean, information is far more readily available to us thanks to the Internet and when you get a lot of information, you start noticing the patterns and poetry in the ways just things happen, you know. You start noticing, let's say, poetic rhymes between the way animals evolve or what happens to ecosystems when they collapse, so on and so forth. And then I think because of this in the current day and age, there's a great interest in lore, that is to say, you don't need to have a story anymore. You don't need to have a pesky character running around, proving himself or herself, you know. No, making worlds, designing histories is an art form in itself. I believe due to the saturation of information offered by the internet, we can now appreciate this. And that's one of the reasons contributing to the current popularity of the speculative evolution genre. Also, I think internet, the internet contributes to it in another way, that is to say, anyone can like, hey, let me make a creature for your world, let's make a world about this, let us all make a ecosystem for that world, you know, people can interchange and collaborate much more easily, and of course that's made much more easier by the internet. But also another risk here is that things become too fluid, you know, people begin their projects and like don't finish them, but I believe on the overall that's a great positive thing. And uh, number five, why does speculative zoology matter in the broader scheme of things? That's a great question. Like if you make, if you, let's say you're like a teenager, you make a speculative zoology project, then you make five more, then you make a book, who knows? Then two things happen. You become adept at wielding the quote unquote weapons of art, text, and editorial expertise altogether. You become an you become an all-around creative contributor. And this ability, how to manage a project with lots of visual assets, lots of text assets, you know, that's like pragmatically speaking, that's a great plus, you know, in any line of work, especially with, uh, let's say, white collar work, advertising, or even like project management, that's a definitive skill. And let me tell you, you wouldn't believe the number of people who cannot understand the context of like what it means to talk about a certain thing, what it means to write about a certain thing, what it means to have images and words coming together to tell a story. Great many of people don't know that. And they're so ignorant about it that you feel like 
they have been living under a stone or something. Now, if you are good at speculative biology, your chances are you're going to be good at that, you know, organizing, telling ideas. But that's just the pragmatic side of thing. That's just the pragmatic side of things. On the other aspect, spiritually, like uh, philosophically, you're attuned to a kind of nuances of life, nuances of history, in a way that many other people are not. You can notice those things, you can write about them, you can talk about them, you become an all-around all interesting person to talk to and have as a friend. Like, you become the kind of person who, when you're on a trek, you stop every 10 seconds to look at a strange leaf or a bug or a turn over a stone or something, and everybody keeps, like, leaving you behind. Oh, by the way, if you got quote-unquote friends who don't keep pace with you, like, imagine you're walking with a group of friends. You see an interesting bug on the wall. You start to look at it. And these quote-unquote dipshit friends of yours, they say, come on, man, we got to get to the club. You know what? Those are not your friends. You don't need to be vengeful about it, but just quietly, pragmatically, silently, and definitely start edging them out of your life. They are people with things to take. They are never going to be people with things to give to you. So that's just a side note from a 37-year-old Jesus. Okay, number six. What are your predictions for the future of speculative biology? By the way, speculative biology, speculative evolution, speculative zoology, I use them all interchangeably, so don't be confused in this podcast. How do you see the genre evolving? Well, I think the... Internet is going to a new level of overdrive with speculative zoology. I see a lot more animation projects developing because a lot more people are studying animation these days and animation tools are generally far more accessible. So I see a bright future with lots of interesting stuff to watch, really. And, you know, it's really a wonderful thing for me to see, like, I had this all tomorrow's book and people are making animated projects out of it. And it's really like brings tears to my eyes to see my creations move around like that. So more animations is definitely one prediction. A great resurgence and, and renaissance of this pro uh, genre is on the horizon, I believe. And there's gonna like, it's gonna be like far more people are gonna be aware of it, especially in the next and the upcoming generation, you know, the generation that's just now drooling on their diapers right now, they're gonna be like far more into this thing. And you know, you're gonna, you're making your little projects now, now they're gonna be legends for the future generation. Because as I told before, people are more interested in the lore of things and you know, they, don't care as necessarily as much about those giant stories about a character or their quest, so to say. So I see good things for the future of speculative uh, biology. But one challenge is going to be the preservation, codification and like just polishing of our many beautiful projects into books for future preservation. I really believe that we need to turn all our projects into like actual ebooks or dead paper books. I think it's like extremely necessary. And, you know, there are lots of interesting uh, speculative evolution projects, but they're just a string of images on Instagram. Now, Instagram has two limitations. One, Instagram comments, people don't really read them because on such a platform, like, your attention span is limited. You could always flick forward. So that's one risk. Number two, what if in 10 years Instagram is shut down? Or, like, it becomes something like the arcane ruins of MySpace. You know, MySpace used to be a great platform. Everybody was there. Everybody who's someone was there. People were meeting up, hooking up, making music from MySpace. MySpace, where is nice MySpace now? It is one with Tyr and Nineveh. It's like that poem, Ozymandias. I am my space, ye mighty king of kings. Look, look upon my user pages and despair. Nothing remains there but the whistling sand of time-worn web pages. I don't know. So with Instagram, there's always that risk. With any social media platform, 
There's always that risk. You have to own your own content. Even like you could make and easily learn to make web pages just by even using Microsoft Word. You know, you don't need to know HTML or any of the WordPress fancy ass stuff. But make learn to make websites and publish your stuff in a website of your own. Or better still, compose your project in a Microsoft Word file, continually update it, and export it as a PDF file. Now, when, you, when people have a PDF, it's like a solid one-pack thing. And it's like one book. I really think I must give you uh, maybe an instruction video or two about how to do these things. I believe it's a duty. We must have a solid single unit versions of our books for the future and that's the only risk i see in the future okay number seven is there a limit to what can be accomplished and created within the confines of speculative biology as a concept and when does an idea leave the realms of this genre entirely i don't think you can never i i think the more you stretch it the more this genre will evolve you could make even like musical life forms i don't know or or like things based on uh, touch i don't know sculpture or you could make something about the speculative evolution of religions or philosophies you know what if there was a religion based not on praising one loving god but cursing one evil god so every day you wake up and you say god damn fuck off evil god don't you bring your crap next to me you know that sort of thing i don't think you can ever like unless maybe it turns into this narrative thing or something like but even if it turns into pokemon that's a speculative evolution project right there no i don't think you can ever leave this project entirely except maybe i don't know rule 34 i don't know i don't know okay and f ian's final question is can we utilize speculative biology as an incubator for the development of more practically applicable concepts, programs, and scientifically based projects? Yes, yes, and yes. In my lifetime, I have seen speculative evolution projects predict the discovery of fossils. Not once, but twice. One was, like, there's an Italian friend of mine, Aless uh, Alessandra Cau, and he... No, sorry, Andrea Cau, that's C-A-U. He's a very famous science writer too. He looked at these three climbing little dinosaurs with extremely long fingers. And he said, you know, what if these guys had like this pterosaur-like membrane? And at the time it was like purely speculative evolution. But then a few years later, they discovered a fossil named Yi Kui, that Chinese dinosaur with the bat-like wings. So there's one. Another example was Tamisiokaris. Like, um, we had a contest about speculative ideas with dinosaurs and prehistoric animals. One of the users created this filter-feeding version of Anomalocaris, which is this kind of prehistoric giant Cambrian monster prone type thing. And then a few years later, they actually discovered a filter-feeding Anomalocaris relative named Tamisiokaris. And the overall clade was uh, named after this speculative creature that this uh, friend had created named Setocaridae or something like that. So already in applied sciences, you have an example of speculative zoology becoming useful. And another example, as I mentioned before in the previous question, that if you're a good speculative uh, zoology or speculative evolution artist and writer, if you make good projects, then chances are you educated yourself in some project management and you know that uh, can apply to many more avenues of work outside science and speculation so that's it everyone i hope these answers help you out too and best of luck to ian for his great and insightful questions i will be back with more content but before i go please Consider donating to me on Patreon.com. Even a dollar a month makes a big difference for me. And the more you donate, the more time I will have to dedicate to my 
rework of All Tomorrows, rework of Snyad. Heck, if you donate to me on Patreon today, you can go and see content from the upcoming All Tomorrows book that no one else gets to see. So there's an incentive. So please support me on Patreon. And as always, have a nice day. Goodbye.